Hello guys, it's David Bose here. Well, it is a really beautiful day in Oklahoma. <laughs> oh buddy, it's so beautiful. I mean, I'm falling in love with Oklahoma here today, all over again. It's just kind of cloudy and cool and breezy and beautiful and a nice summer day. Hope you're having a wonderful day where you are. Friends, I have something mind-blowing to talk to you about today. I mean, my mind is blown regularly, but this, the revelations that are coming right now into the world are mind-blowing and so revealing. We've had some questions that we, I don't think we've tied all the loose ends up yet. Why is any of this going on? What would, have you ever sat around wondering why bad people do what bad people do? Well, how could they do that? I just don't understand how they could stand there in, in broad daylight and just hurt that person or, or, or just be mean or, 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 or pop cops because it's their job and they're told to. They can just run around and beat people up and harass people and, and, and go to bed and sleep at night. Or, or, or doctors that are running around making millions of dollars off of procedures and drugs that are killing people. And, and, and churches that can shun their, their children or their family members or something. The hypocrisy, the blind faith, the, the, the wars, the lies the politicians tell. How do these people do it? And we think, well, maybe they're evil. And then we realize, wait a minute, you know, I've done things wrong too. And the Bible says not to judge. And so it's hard to understand. But that's just the surface, thinking about this world. Uh, when you really want to sit around and do some thinking, come on over and have a glass of my wine with me and, and some evening, and, and we'll sit around the campfire, and man, we'll have some thoughts batting around, you know, in our mind. And we'll we'll talk about some deep stuff, because... Sometimes I wonder, I mean, there are so many things that you could just sit around and wonder. Like, the world itself, we've been talking about, the physical world itself, with all the bugs and snakes and mosquitoes and ticks, what is their purpose? And, and you say, well, this is the classroom. We've been doing this for thousands of years. Talk about the day of judgment. But these judgments have been coming. These plagues have been coming upon mankind ever since we were born. And I don't mean individual people. Ever since human race was born. And and it's, you say, well, it's something to do with humans. It's a spiritual process, Dave. Yes, I believe that. But we have to explain because there's a lot. There's a lot to explain. See, we got to figure this out. We can't just say something. I think we need to know it from our heart. We have to understand it because look at these animals. They're undergoing the same evil that we're going through. The coyotes are suffering. Just the ones out running around, you know, you may have, oh, I don't like coyotes running around. They're after my sheep. And so, okay, fine. If, if we're going to, we're gonna, that, well, that's one of the questions. How do, how do we get along when uh, farmers just got to have uh, sheep, right? And they got to have crops. And, and so, he, oh, here comes a lion. He's about to eat one of my sheep. So I, I kill the lion. What a dog eat dog world. What kind of a world is this? I know, see, that maybe this is why people end up just doing what they're told. I mean, think about it. The first person that decided, well, I'm hungry. There's nothing to eat. Hey, how about let's kill that little fluffy rabbit, you know, and, and the children standing around while dad's ripping this bloody carcass, you know, skinning it out and, and, and you know, <laughs> frying it on a campfire. And saying, you eat this. I mean, I don't think there was ever a first person that ever did it. It's like, which came first? The chicken or the egg? But the thing of it is, we were born. And and then, then this deity that decided he was our God and there is none else. Who decided, you know, we were his people. And we had to make a covenant. It was almost mandatory that we signed at the bottom line. And he was very angry, a vengeful deity. hateful, said his name was jealous and said if anybody did anything wrong lightning would come down from heaven and strike him they had to attend all the festivals and bring their sheep and their lamb case case they committed some sin and somehow you can expiate your sin so this is something that people have been doing and this deity taught 
David how to, you know, his taught his hands for warfare. But here's a big part of what we did not know. I was, we've been talking about the book of Revelation. We've been talking specifically about a few important things that were just huge revelations. One was this word, pharmakios, or pharmakia. And in Revelation 18.23, it says that when Babylon is falling, Babylon is falling, Babylon the Great, the mother of the harlots, and she ha and the wine of her fornication that she's caused all the nations to drink, and she's a, a whore, and she's, you know, and the nations are having this illicit affair with this harlot. And she's riding upon this great beast that runs the world and the ten horns, the kings of the world. And she controls them. And she's got a cup in her hand. And she's buying and selling linen and, and gold and silver and frankincense and men's souls, it says. And it says, her greatest sin is this Greek word, pharmakia. Because of her awful, terrible sin of pharmakia. The whole world has been deceived. You look up the word pharmakia and you find out that it has to do with drugs. It's where we get the word pharmacy or farm, you know, pharmacist. The, is the person who gives drugs to people and potions like a witch doctor. And so it's a druggist. We find out that early healers like therapeutai they were healers or the physicians. They took a vow. To this day, doctors are supposed to take this vow to do no harm, commit no abortions, to use not a knife, and no drugs, only natural herbs and rest. And nature was the only thing that was followed in prayer, fasting, and getting your mind right, and everything else following. And this was what the original physician did, following from Aristotle down. But there was another group of individuals that deviated off from the true science. And they were forbidden to even practice in many periods of time in history. But what we don't know, like the other day when we were talking about the words having little families, like a whole family of words that have to do with doing something wrong. Okay, and it has to do with being on a pathway. In all of the words, there's variations of it. So in Greek, you would say, oh, he fell down. Okay, but there's a word for that. Maybe it doesn't, maybe it's, it's not so expressive of that, is that. Because for us, that's a sentence. He fell down. Not a word. But they would have a word that meant that. He fell down. You know, right in the, in the word itself, you can tell whether there's a he or she or it's neuter or whatever. It's all right there in the word. And the word says, he fell down. Okay, so if the root is pathway, either falling off the path, falling down, turning around on the path and getting going the wrong way, different words, but they all have to do. So if you have this view of the word, not just some mechanical meaning, then you know deeper what the word means. But so, so in the days of the Greek speaking peoples, Hebrew was a lot like this too. And many of the ancient languages were very similar. They knew what they were talking about much better than we know what we're talking about. First of all, because they were speaking the language. It was a, not a dead language. So they knew that language. It was their, their culture. And if knowing the language, they knew that it was a little sentence and they understood it. They knew the root of the meaning of the word, the path. They knew it didn't mean evil, like we say, or sin. Today, sin is something very evil. See, oh man, he's a sinner. He's going to hell. But in those days, the word just meant, oh, he fell down. And they had other words that talked about you could get back up. So everybody knew what the word meant. It wasn't as harsh as ours. And we talk about the archer description. There were these words like missing the mark and needing to practice. And this is why we don't understand why it says whoever practices sin. Well, for them, it meant nobody's going to on purpose miss the mark. And that's the only thing we have to make sure we don't do. So we need, we need to know the meanings, the, the roots. So now we've got this word pharmakia. We've discovered that it has something to do with um, medicine and drugs. 
And we find all throughout the book of Revelation, different places in the New Testament about these plagues that are coming. So, where did this whole concept come from? Well, we need to know the root of this pharmakia and why and the true meaning of it. Because it's really going to be the central theme as to what is going to help us, I think, finally, is another like little pathway into the meaning of this whole concept that we're about to go through. What is the world doing? Why are we in this mess? Going headlong. Is the Bible really true and all these things are going to happen because God said so? Or is this book, are the very people that's running the world today, did they write all this, these books and they're just making it happen? Is there some reason for this Hegelian law that we're under, this democratic, uh, republican, socialist, capitalist, you know, black and white, male and female world where everything's dual and and everybody's got to take sides and go to war? Is there some sort of weird, crazy plan? Did they really... Did, perhaps they, they, they designed the capital in the Greek architecture of Athens because they're, they're, they've got a plan, that they know what these words mean, that, that, that it's important to them to get all the little particulars down, that they've been following uh, a path to control mankind and keep us in darkness for thousands of years. And we never knew why they were doing any of this. Maybe all the wars are set up for something. Let me show you something. I found that this word pharmacos has a really deep meaning that is even more telling than what we have been looking at. Look what this says here. It says, the Greek ritual scapegoat referred to as the pharmakos. Okay, now, pharmakia means drugs. Okay? In some form or another. But now here's the word pharmakos, and we'll see that it is related to this other word. It's just the ending, the os on the end, which is different. Just a different same root, same word, but it's in some other context or, or tense. But how could that be? Because they're saying that it's a Greek ritual, scapegoat. Provides an essential foundation for the study of legendary lives of the archaic Greek poets. The lives of Aesop. Remember Aesop's fables? Hipponax and Theoratus are especially clo close to pharmacos themes and characteristics. The Greek ritual scapegoat is a complex religio-historical phenomenon and aspects of it have been vigorously debated by scholars. Nevertheless, that the pharmacos complex existed in some form is und undoubted. Ritual. The pharmacos was a human embodiment of evil. Now, hang on. <laughs> Are you guys seeing this as we're starting to, to read about this word. This is perfect. Like it, it couldn't be, it's, it, it's not, it can't be some coincidence. The book of Revelation is about the Antichrist, the scapegoat, right? But you got to hear where this all came from. You know, all we ever hear is where all this kind of came from in terms of the Old Testament. We know that in the Old Testament religion, they had a scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. And they would send one away and put a little red ribbon around it and it would carry the sins of the people away. Well, this, according to a man named Gerard, we're, we're going to look at his concept here. There have been those who have studied this history and, and culture and societies. And this is at every culture, not just the Jews, not just your Bible, but every culture believes in this very same. Remember, we've been saying... All the nations of the earth believed in the same gods with astrology. There's 12 gods and they sit around the table and it's the 12 astrological houses and each of the god rules in different ages. It's just that the Jewish people, when they went down into Babylon, they began to only understand the bottom of the wheel, the darkness, the law, the carnal nature. And they didn't know anything about the spiritual. And that's why Jesus came and talked about his father who's above and your father's beneath and your father is the devil and a liar, and a murderer, and he's not love, and he's hate, 
And Jesus said, this is not what I want to do. No eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but let's love one another and forgive. And so something, but, but the point is, is that all nations knew about these particular gods. And the God of the Jewish people was worshipped in Babylon as well. Yah. And they called him Yah in Egypt. And the Israelites knew about El as well. And they worshipped El at Bethel in the north. But they also worshipped Yahweh in Jerusalem. And they had two sets of priesthoods. They had the Levitical priests. And then they had the Melchizedek priesthood. Which a lot of people don't realize is it's the same thing as the Nazarite priests. And David was a Melchizedek priest. It says that in, in Psalms. He was made a Melchizedek priest after the order of Melchizedek. But we know that David went to the priesthood at um, Bethel to get a different ephod. And he danced and got the Holy Spirit. And that's why he was able to eat from the show bread. Because he was a, of the greater priesthood. And this is also what happened to Christ. Though he was not a Levite, yet he was our high priest. Because he came after the order of Melchizedek. So we've got the Old Testament traditions, but we don't understand how it relates to the whole ball of wax. We don't understand the whole thing because there's, in the New Testament, a lot of Greek ideas seeping into this whole concept as if it's now Greek. The whole the God in the New Testament is Theos over and over again. Sometimes they call him Uranus in the New Testament. And there's a place where the angels are sent to prison called Tartarus. And Jesus describes, it's the same as the Greek mythology. And then Jesus describes how people go, you know, after death to, to the place of paradise, or some go to Hades or Tartarus. And in hell, they lift up their eyes. And there's this great chasm in between. And this is the story, a Greek mythology about Tartarus and the boat Chiron that took your soul. So, but there's this great chasm, and you either go to paradise, the, the Elysian Islands, or you go unto Tartarus. So all of the, this is now we know. Those of my subscribers who have been watching me for a while. We've studied this out. And we know. We've studied this. It's all the same. There's no difference. All the religions have the same teachings. And they all taught about the coming Christ and the Antichrist. And this is the great mystery. And the Apostle Paul says, I speak of Christ in his church. When he's talking about marriage. Everything that we were did. Given rituals and ceremony. All this was types and shadows. Of some greater reality. And so it's important that we understand. Because in the Greek New Testament. Which was written in Greek. We need to understand these Greek words. So that we understand what the Greek writers. The apostles were trying to tell us. And here they're talking about something. That's very similar to the Jewish concept of a scapegoat. But they're talking in Greek. And they're using the word pharmakos. So it says, um, it says the name is probably, but problematically connected with pharmacon, medicine, drug, poison. Now you see what it's saying? The name pharmacos, which is the embodiment of evil that they use in a ritual, some scapegoat. But they're saying now that it's also related problematically. They don't quite understand why, but the word is related to pharmacon. Pharmacos, pharmacon. It's the same word, just with the N or the S different. And all that means, I mean, it's like Apollos, Apollyon, Apollo. It's, it's the same word, friends. But, remember, there's groups of words. Fall down, fall off the path, fall, you know, turn around, get, you know, stumble off the path and go the wrong way. And stubbornly, that's another word that you know, uh, apostate, right, is what we translate it. When you purposely just get up and leave and don't want to come back. Now you can understand when you know what the meaning of the basic image of the of the root. So here, we've got to understand what this word pharmacon means because it's what, it's not just a word in a book of Revelation, but it really is the whole basis and premise for society, according to Gerard and other scholars. But look at what they're saying about this. So, the name is problematically connected with pharmacon, medicine, drug, poison. Both poison and drug were originally magical. Well, again, this is his words, but I see what he's trying to say here. 
magical, meaning that this was religious experience. This was a spiritual thing that they believed something magical or godly or spiritual would happen. They People who believed in these drugs were involved in spiritualism in a sense, and they had their god. And these rituals weren't just because they were playing. This was, you know, remember, there were many people who had many different methods and gods and so forth the ways that people worshipped around the world. And so the Greeks believed this was magic, in a sense, or, or special and spiritual. And so this was the magic man, the pharmacon. You got the, the magic drug, well, this is the magic man. And then it says wizard, wise man. First, though the borderline between magic and religion is not easy to define, the early pharmacos might have been magic man or he might have been sacred man. Then presumably he or she was healer, poisoner. Hmm? So the man himself is the drug? Now we're beginning to understand what this word drugs mean. I mean, it's not just the drug, but it's, the word has a meaning about what the drug is used for, like in the sense of medicine. Like medicine man. Okay, so now we've got the, the one who gives the medicine and one who is the the medicine for the world because he's a scapegoat and there's a reason that we're going to use this man as our medicine. Uh, this is what they did. I'm just saying. That's the connection. It's still talking about this spiritual thing. It's not saying then that the man is a drug, but it might be saying that the man is a priest of some kind who administers these drugs. But it might not even be necessarily literally a drug because, as we'll see, it can be an experience that the world needs more than it needs medicine necessarily. But Reading on, the latter expiatory sacrifice for the city and rascal offscurings and so on. So in other words, the man's death could be the, the medicine or the poison that the world may need. On the one hand, the pharmacos could be the medicine that heals the city, according to Scolia and Aristophanes. And pharmacos is used in order to obtain a therapia. That's where we get the word therapy. Service, tending medical treatment for the prevailing disaster. On the other hand, he could be the poison that had to be expelled from the system. He is often ugly or as a criminal. Thus, these two interpretations are not exclusive. Sometimes the pharmacos crisis was real, such as a plague or famine. Plagues, guys, anyone? As at Massilia. For the Massilians, as often as they were suffering from the plague, quote, and colophon, either famine or plague or another harm, kept coming to them. Sometimes it was a periodic calendric moment of crisis, as in the Attic Thargelia, when the city had to be cleansed before the first fruits of the harvest could be stored up. See, every nation had this concept. I heard someone explain it this way. Let's say that you were an ancient, primitive city-state, uh, the city of Ur or, or Chaldea or whatever in that area, um, in Chaldea, and there was a huge tornado or hurricane coming. It's going to wipe the whole city off the map or something, an earthquake. And they looked at it, they looked at the, the world like, okay, evil is a natural thing. They didn't understand evil. They didn't like it, okay, but it had to be appeased. And so they looked at it kind of like a dark cloud. You look up in the sky and you see a dark cloud and you say, well, it's getting dark. You know, maybe it's going to rain. And rain, a little rain's good. That's refreshing. But a storm or a hurricane can destroy crops and it can be very bad. Maybe it could be a drought. It could be anything bad. But they look up at this cloud and they see the, the dark cloud beginning to maybe have a little lightning. Right? It's building. They know that some very bad evils got to get discharged. Something bad's going to happen. 
And they know that lightning is going to strike and somebody's going to get killed. They just know that. That's the way the life is. They can't, it's not, they're not responsible. It's this evil God that's responsible. He's going to bring down his fury. Somebody did something wrong. It's the balance of nature. Somebody's got to pay. That God wants a sacrifice. He wants, we got to have a scapegoat or else the whole city could perish. This is how they used to believe, and this is what all nations put down as what, per se, religion is today. A way to appease this God, because we're all sinners, supposedly. Although, according to Jesus, there's another way, which is what we're going to get to. So, somebody, the town had to get together and decide, okay, God's pretty angry, and he's going to kill somebody. He's pretty mad. So, all right, who's going to hand over the one that's guilty? So they go out and they try to find somebody, you know, the ugliest, uh, maybe somebody that's got a big hunchback, and, and you know, he talks to himself or, or whatever, and, and uh, you know, he's crazy, and, well, he's got to be full of spirits, and he's got to be evil, and he's got to be satanic, so they'll kill him, right? They, t they take a poor homeless schizophrenic, and they drag him, you know, and beat him, and maybe in an auditorium, so everybody can see. They don't like evil. They're, you know, we're going to appease the God. You know, we're going to get rid of the evil in our world. Maybe they'll take a virgin and, and sacrifice her before everyone to let God know how much they love order and how much they'll get down and obey him as long as he don't hurt anybody because his wrath is coming. So this is what they would do. It's all there. It's even in the, the the Old Testament. You know, the Day of Atonement came every year. And this is why in the book of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul says, this is, this is not how you get rid of sin because it's, it just reminds you of sin from year to year. This is an imperfect system. This is why Christ died once and for all. We don't have to go through this anymore because they've been worshiping the wrong deity. The devil's the one that wants your blood, wants your sacrifice. Jesus was murdered and sent to hell by Yahweh and he bore our stripes so let me read on at Athens there was a pharmacos for males and one for females they would lead out two men to serve as a cleansing now look at these words in Greek catharsia you ever had you remember the word cathartic Oh, it was a very cathartic experience. Well, do you know what you're saying? No, we're just using words. Today, the English language is full of words that mean nothing. And we have no idea what we're saying. Oh, it just sounds right to use that word, but we don't know what it means. Well, it means that the world is in a big crisis. You're having a crisis is what you're saying when you're using that word. You're having a total crisis. And you can just go over and slap somebody right in the face or, 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 or go out and kill a cat. And now you're having a cathartic moment because it's, oh, you've appeased the, the evil within you. But you see, the problem is you're just going to, now you, you're, just, you're just feeding the evil is what you're really doing, aren't you? Because now that you've fed the evil, he's got to be fed. And every time he needs to be fed, you've got to go out and hurt somebody again, right? And that's the only way to get him off your back. Well, that's how the world worked up until Christ. And presently, it's still working because people haven't accepted Christ to this day. They won't accept love. They're under the delusion, the strong delusion. And they think that somehow or another by... By, by vengeance, the world will be made righteous. See, that's what the law of Moses is. It's vengeance, saith the Lord. My name is Jealous. I will not pardon your sins under the third and the fourth generation. That's why this is so important that we understand because it's going to separate the sheep from the goats in the latter days, which is the day we're in. So, catharsia for the city of the Thargelia, one on behalf of the men and one on behalf of the woman. Hmm, is this, you know, how Jesus said, look, I came in my father's name and you did not receive me. But when he comes in his own name, you, he will, you will receive. And he also said, you'll not see me henceforth until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, I came, you rejected me, and I'm not coming again until you get down on your knees and confess. And bless, you know, I can't come if you don't want me. 
For those who want me, I'm, I, will, I will knock and I will enter. But those who don't, I, you will not see me again. But when he comes in his own name, like it says all through the Old Testament, I am Yahweh, that is my name. I'm coming in my own name. I'll redeem my people myself. I'll come down and bend the heavens and I'll redeem them. And how is he going to redeem them? By murdering every man, woman, and child in their blood. Well, see, that's why Jesus died for us. Because Jesus was in Adam, in man, from the founding of the world. We've discussed that in various places. So G Christ was in us. And he was crucified from the founding of the world. He was cursed right there in the garden. And he went down through hell and bore it. And overcame him and got the keys of Hades and death. So he thwarted his plan. But many people have not grasped it or received him. And they're still looking for their, for the one that they're looking for, that the ones that they'll receive. And so, if there's going to be this man and this woman that they carried out, that's their side of the bargain. I said, well, that's what they want to do. We're not talking about what Jesus is telling us he's going to do. No, Jesus says he's coming back in our hearts, right? The woman's going to give birth to the, the, the male child who will rule the world within, you know, for a thousand years. But, but this is their idea. And their idea was that they would take a man and a woman, beat them and kill them. Is that a little bit like Revelation chapter 11 that says that the two witnesses will preach for 1,260 days and at the end of that time they shall kill them and they shall send gifts to one another and make merry and said these two prophets tormented those who dwell upon the earth. The whole world will rejoice when the two witnesses are killed. And they'll dance and it's the great time of Christmas. Or should we say, I think they celebrated this in around June or May. Let's, let's read what they used to do. And this, cause this is what the book of Revelation is talking about, this pharmacon. So, uh, on behalf of the men and one on behalf of the woman, sometimes he was chosen by public vote in case of the pharmacos as a criminal. This public council would take the form of a trial, which must lie behind his selection. Well, interestingly, how in the New Testament, it says that there's the false prophet and there's the two witnesses. The false prophet brings fire down from heaven and tells everybody to worship the Antichrist, right? We've already said that man of sin is in us, just like the Christ is in us. We talked about that the other day. We'll explain that a little bit more here in a second. Because we're waiting, the Apostle Paul says, for the revealing of the son of perdition or the son of the, wick, the man of sin. We get, it has to be revealed, but it can't be revealed until the apostasy comes first. Something has to happen. The love of the greater number has to cool off so that there's more wicked people in the world. Otherwise, if there's more good people than the, this, this man of sin, not a real, may not even be one particular man. We're talking about the greater Antichrist, right? Like the great Babylon the Great, not the little city but the greater Babylon well here we're talking about the great Antichrist which is in you right the flesh and the lust of the flesh but we didn't know who this was we didn't understand law or grace we didn't understand love we didn't even know who we were we'll never understand it it's got to be revealed this is why Jesus said to Peter who am I Peter and he says you're the son of the living God and Jesus said, nobody could have revealed that to you but the Father. The Father revealed that to you, Peter. See, you can't get this revelation and, uh, unless the Father grant it. It's a revelation. And, you, and, and, and the whole world's got to decide. And so there's going to be two prophets. The two witnesses will preach and bring fire down out of heaven and turn the waters to blood anytime they wish. And there's going to be a trial and the whole world's going to have to make a decision. And then it says he was called pharmacos. Katharma. That which is thrown away in cleansing, offscurings, refuse, a sacrifice, in plural, purification. Perikatharma. An intensification of katharma. Cleanse on all sides or completely. Wipe around, clean, 
anything wiped off off screen. At Cheranoia, an expelled slave was called Bulimos, ravenous hunger. The whole expulsion process was called catharsis. See, the whole city went through this catharsis. They knew that the lightning was going to strike. The devil was coming. Their crops were going to get ruined. Somebody was going to die. So they all voted. Oh, let's take those two. We hate them. They're evil. They don't respect Yahweh. They won't take the mark of the beast. They're still standing in their string, in their faith. Right? If we don't get rid of these idiots, you know, this, this guy named Jesus who says he's Christ, right? If we don't kill him, then all the people might perish. We've got to appease this angry God. So let's take the two witnesses and throw them out in the street and kill them. And then we'll make merry and send gifts to one another in, uh, in like Christmas time in, in, in spring, right? So the whole expulsion process was called catharsis. For example, Callimachus tells us that the Abdera, a purchased man, became the purification catharsin for the city. Pharmakeo, pharmakoi, were sometimes fed by the state, often for a considerable length of time. Sometimes as at colophon, and they were fed immediately before expulsion. Brimmer notes that being kept by the state was usually reserved for only for very important people. On the day of his departure, the pharmacos was dressed in holy garments, vestibas, sacris. Remember in Sa Zechariah, uh, we read where, which is the parallel to Revelation chapter 11. But in Zechariah, I think, what, verse 3, chapter 3 there, it says um, that one of the two witnesses was standing there and the angel looks down and says, where's his holy garments? Put put beautiful garments upon him and a turban. Give him clean garments. See, they always give the scapegoats, these two witnesses, they give him clean garments. Holy garments, vestibus, and adorned with sprigs. At Athens, the two pharmakoi were black and white figs. The holy garments show the positive sac sacral side of the scapegoat, which is also suggested by another name for pharmakoi, sabakoi, fellow possessed. Remember, even in the, the Old Testament, there was the two goats. There was the goat for the people and the scapegoat. So, this suggests that there was an ecstatic, perhaps Dionysiac aspect of the pharmacos. Ogden writes that the name probably means that scapegoats were held to be in some sort of divinely possessed, ecstatic, and exceptionally powerful state at the point of their expulsion. After a procession, well, that's what they're doing here in the world. They're getting us all riled up. And I'll tell you what I believe is about to happen here in just a minute. After a procession and a circumambulation, an important part of the rite, the pharmacoi were driven from the city and then chased away by stoning, a ritual that provides community solidarity. If the whole world hates that evil and runs it off and kills it, then, he, then, then, then you see, the catharsis has occurred and society and civilization can go forward. But there's got to be somebody's got to die. And all who stone participate in the punishment gives them solidarity and it extends extrudes its chosen object. At Colophon, the scapegoat was reportedly beaten around the genitals by fig sprays. I don't know what that is. Probably a fig branch. And squills, large onions. Outside the city, according to some accounts, whose re reliability has been thoroughly debated, he was killed by stoning, burning, or by being thrown over the cliff into the ocean. At the very least, the reports of the pharmacos death show society's desire for it. Expulsion itself is a kind of symbolic death. There is some evidence, at least, that the death of the pharmacos was seen ideologically as a sacrifice, as a number of sources refer to the victim as being killed or sacrificed, as it says also in the book of Revelation, guys. A scholar writes, victima immolator, the victim is sacrificed. Murray rightly observes that these are late scolio and that the earliest sources do not speak of killing or sacrificing. Even if this is accepted, it's indisputable that there was a mimema 
of a death in the pharmacon pattern. Okay, going on down here. It says, the pharmacos custom actually took place, though details of it has been practiced are not always certain, but these rituals occur occurrences were always rightly bound up with stories serving as atia for the uh, Athenian tradition. Adrogeus Ad Androgeus is a figure who has not been given the attention he deserves, as pharmacos theorists have tended to focus on the ritual itself. It is significant that he was an athlete who had been victorious in the Panthaniac Games, defeating all the contestants in the games. He is thus a type of youthful vigor and ag agonistic victory, rather than the deformed refuse one might expect as background for a pharmacos myth. In one variant of his death legend, he was killed by the men he had defeated. He was waylaid and murdered by the jealous competitors. Androgeus subsequently received hero cult and keramikos and salarium. This data show an identification of the athlete heroes of Fontenot's important article on hero cult. The athlete as hero with Androgeus and presumably to the pharmacos when Androgeus was murdered. He was on his way to Thebes to take part in the Laius funeral games. See, what we don't understand is, is they've been using these methods, even after we stopped religion, right? And then we, there was a separation of church and state. We all decided that we weren't going to force people, right? We, we had matured. We got a constitution. We had liberty and justice for all. And so the devil had to screw our minds around a little deeper to get us to realize or to get us to, to not realize that liberty means both political liberty and religious, not just religious. That we're, we should be allowed to do whatever we want. And that's what the Constitution says. You shall make no law concerning my liberty. In other words, I have freedom from God. Right? Inalienable. You can't take it away from me. You can't make a law. There are no law. I have freedom. And I go by the natural laws of gravity and so forth. I go, go by the reality of the world the way it is. I don't go by man's law, but by God's. But as soon as they did that, okay, we didn't have to obey the queen no more. We didn't have to obey. We elected our own president. You know, a representative of the people. A government for people and by the people, but we lost it because we just somehow they convinced us that we're not under religion, but we're still under government, which is exactly the same thing. There never was a religion. Judaism was a government. Okay, and inside the government is the court of the temple, which is religious, but it's not the word religion. Yeah, it may have been ritualistic, it may have been superstitious, it may have had all these beliefs, and they enforced it by by civil law. Punishable by death. Even just to to, to, to to not say your honor. Or to blaspheme their God or anything. And you could be put to death. And that's the law of the government. And it's getting to the point where that's what we're under now. The government tells us everything we can do. And everything we cannot do. And so down through the ages they've had control. So we still have the court. It's just we don't understand it. But the courthouse... It's still called the court, which is the court of the temple. And you go in, they're still wearing robes and they got a Bible on them. You got to put your hand on it and go by their authority and swear to their God. We're still under it. The guy comes out from behind the curtain, you know, and he's up on a stage, right? That means he's elevated and, and he's above you and you got to get down and grovel. And the words are still all there. He's a magistrate. He's your majesty. Okay, so... They then control everything. And they know that the people get angry and bad things can happen. So they want to expiate in the people's minds. They want the people to not be angry because they don't want you to know that you are running the show. See, as long as they can keep you in, in, the, in the fear, go back to Yahweh's mountain. The people were in fear and they trembled in fear. And Moses said, oh, Lord. Don't kill them all, please. What about your reputation? You just brought them up out of Egypt. Million people, three million people. And now you're going to just 
in your wrath, murder them all out here in the desert? What about your reputation? The world will think you're crazy. We're scared. Please don't kill everybody. And he entreated like a lawyer, like an attorney for the people. Moses pleaded for the people. And this is what Jesus does. He pleads before this evil, rotten deity and says, no, 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 I'll take their sins. This is where we get the pleading on the mercy of the court. Okay, you're pleading to for mercy against the law. We're not talking about justice. There's a law and it had a punishment and there was no escape. And this is the only escape is that the law is fulfilled and Jesus fulfilled the law for us. We signed at the bottom line. We took upon ourselves the curse. So this, the governments all around the world in every nation have all worked on the same principle. And even in times, modern times, we're under this constitution we're, now it's all turned over to the government, which is all still religious. We're still using all the same words. We've got our Bibles. We go to the pews. The preacher's up on the platform, just like the judge. And he shuns you from the congregation. Well, now that's all kind of overturned into the government. They take you to prison. But they're still, remember, working on the basis that there has to be a sacrifice. Rome did it. Israelites did it. Babylon did it. Everybody's always done it, and we're doing it now. So what they do is they got to get everybody in the world to believe that the problem is gone. Expiate the sin. So because there's so such a big world and people are changed, we're different now. You know, we don't have supposedly superstitions, right? But we do. Because we believe in their doctors like as if they are gods. And we're completely deceived and they can do whatever they want. So what they do is they they spend years building up our minds into some frenzy until it gets to the point of something's lightning's got to strike. We're so upset that, that something's got to, we've got to be appeased. The anger of the people or the crying or the, the injustice that's just going on. And, and, and for other people to be able to go on, they need the injustice to be meted and, 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 and cured or, or that's what they believe. Although Jesus told us we just need to forgive each other and love each other. But they believe that somebody's got to die. There needs to be a sacrifice. You've got to kill somebody. So they would have uh, the Colosseum and they would bring out the Christians and the lions would eat them. Jesus was the scapegoat, guys. And then the Christians followed. And they're going to do it again. They'll use Muslims. They'll use whatever. Kamikaze pilots in Japan. Poor, poor people that are just walking down the street in Tiananmen Square. They don't care. It doesn't matter whether it's Mao, Stalin, or Hitler. They're all working under the same principles. And so what they got to do, and so this is why every year we have football games, right? We think, oh, and it's got to be, you know, trust me, these football games are, are rigged. That's why you got these one, this one guy that's going, he's going to retire any day, right? But his last three or four years before he retires, he wins every Super Bowl. They have their ways. But what they do is they orchestrate these games so that it, it's like cathargic feelings and we think, ah, victory. Now we can go forth for the rest of the week because our team won. We killed them, right? We got them. Them darn people. We get our mind on some stupid thing like football instead of the, tr the true things going on in the world. Well, that wasn't going to be enough. We got to have a reset now. The whole world is about, it's like, it, 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 people just can't go on because we now have history books. We know what they've been doing to us. We know they've been lying to us and they know that they're being exposed. So they brought out people, the biggest goons they could find, scapegoats, Pelosi, Biden, he's a scapegoat. They shoved him into office on purpose. We didn't vote him in, and you know that. And they found the biggest goon, some old geezer, who puts into place policies that, that are hurting people. The most draconian, ridiculous stuff, but it's all controlled at the highest level. 
They know exactly what they're doing. They know that you can't do this forever. Either all of us have got to perish, right? And, they, and that's what this is about, right? They're either trying to get the chokehold or this is some game that's going to end in some sort of expiation, some catharsis sacrifice that the whole world's going to stand back in a, in a, in a, uh, you know, blue beam moment, a great hologram event or something, or, or some, uh, oh, we made it to Mars or we met aliens and they just landed at the White House and we've made a, a, a galactic agreement with a federation of stars or, or just what it says there in the book of Revelation. They will take all their fury and angry, angriness out on those who will not worship the beast. And they will convince the rest of the world to hate us. Because that's why they'll send gifts to one another and, and be merry. Because those two prophets tormented the world. Because they will be so deceived by their shenanigans to believe that the only reason that we're in such a crisis is because you guys aren't obeying. We can't have any more anarchy where people out in the streets doing... They're the ones tearing down the buildings, not us. Love doesn't do that. But they'll try to blame us. They'll try to blame those who just don't want to participate in this kind of evil. Because we don't want to go on the merry-go-round one more time. Because every so often you got to have another crisis and somebody's got to die. And guess what? It doesn't give us eternal life. It's just around and around and around in rebirth and death. An eye for an eye. A tooth for a tooth. I'm telling you, I noticed this some time ago. I've been thinking about this and I thought, man, I, I can't deny what I'm seeing here. This Biden's too stupid. There's no way. Even the bad side, the, the devil himself, wouldn't be so stupid as to put somebody in there that nobody respected, had no respect from anybody, wasn't voted in by anybody, couldn't pull a crowd on... You know, when he was uh, campaigning more than 50 people inside of a classroom at, at a local school, let alone a whole stadium like Trump was. I'm telling you, friends, they have a plan. They're frustrating us all around the world. We're all of us standing around waiting to see what's about to happen, and they know it. They know that we're surprised. They know we're shocked. They know we're scared. And they know we just want peace. They know we haven't got it in us, most of us, to fight them. And though many people today have learned through the generations about love, about Christ, about forgiveness. And it's in, there's a lot of people that that is in there and they can't take it out. And they won't be able to win. Those who are sealed in the forehead, he can't have them. But there are those who don't have lamps, they don't have light in their lamps, they haven't been paying attention. And as it was in the days of Noah, men were eating and drinking and giving in marriage until the flood swept them all away. They took no notice. And they said, where is this promised presence of his? For before, you know, from the beginning till now, things are all the same. From the days of our forefathers, nothing has changed. He's not coming. And then they begin to beat their fellow servants. My master's delaying his coming. You're the problem. They take it out on us. They deceive, they lie. And they say, well, we've got to carry on. There's too many angry people. So we have to intimidate them and get them to, to understand they've got no, you know, scare them and slowly brainwash them and then use our plan that we've always used. 
get them all worked up about something that isn't even real. Just a big, you know, pretend there's a great crisis coming and give them a cathargic moment. Give them a big one, a big scapegoat that makes them feel like everything's okay and they can go on. And they and, and Jesus says they will believe they have done God's service when they have killed us. And so this is a plan, friends. That's what it is. This is a plan by this government, by Yahweh. He's the ruler of this world. And he wants to get some of you to be so deceived that you won't believe in Jesus and go with us who believe in Jesus in our kingdom of love because you don't believe in love and forgiveness because you thought you believed in it, but then you got all excited with the crowd and the big orgy. You know, in the book of Revelation, it uses the word orgy, and it's translated wrath. Did you know that every word we have in English is probably completely from Greek or some other ancient Hebrew or Phoenician or something, or, you know, Latin, and, and these words all go back to the Greek. So we use the word orgy today as some sort of thing where I guess sounds good to most people. Like, oh, orgy, great, you know. It just means we're going to go and have love, right? Yeah, it's love. No, orgy is wrath. Orgy is a, is, is a something that they would do on this holy day to purge the city. You know the movie that came out, Purge? That's what they're planning, friends. Purge. That's the only way they can keep going. Because there's too many people that are waking up you got to stifle them and purge them or else you can't continue on with this system of greed and, and, and evil. You've got to convince the people that the bad in the world is actually the good and the good is actually the bad. So what they'll do is they'll get the whole world so far against socialists, Biden. They'll be throwing tomatoes at Biden soon. The whole world. You watch. The Democrats are going to go on a big campaign against Biden themselves. The whole world will be standing in the street cheering for Donald Trump. And they'll be cheering because he saved the world and gave him a little thing called a VAX. And we'll all forget about that because the crisis has been averted. The bad guys have been put in Guantanamo Bay. Everything's fine now, guys. Go back to sleep. Maybe they'll have public executions. We got them. We'll have a big reset. And now they really got you. Now AI takes over. you willingly walked right into their their plan. So what do we do? So, well, Dave, I don't know what you're telling me. I mean, I'm not supposed to, you know, like Biden in my now, right? <laughs> so I'm supposed to support Biden? No. I'm only telling you. They, they know you don't like Biden. They know you don't like this, what's going on in the world. They know you're scared. And you ought to be. You shouldn't like it. But when they give you their solution, don't fall for it. That's all I'm saying, guys. I'm David Vos. I'm going to go ahead and go and leave it here. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a great one.